Today we're looking at some Dungeons and Dragons, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, but we're also going to be um, covering a topic that covers a lot of other gaming systems as well, and that's always something that's worth remembering. Uh, you can always transpose a lot of what we do here with other game systems. So uh, the next point I want to bring up is I want to thank my Patreons. Thank you very much for your support and it helps to know that I'm on the right track and I'm doing things that most people kind of like. So that's always good. All right, now the point that I want to start off with is a question that's come from one of my patrons and that is about time. Um, not so much time overall. I mean, time is important to keep track of. In, in a one-shot or in a tournament, uh, you've got a limited amount of time to um, play with things and you need to, um, you know, you've got four hours, three hours and so on. But with the um, campaign, you've got a timeline of events and where you want things to move through and go and around. And if the players spend too much time in one location, then that can really come into play with what happens elsewhere. Sorry, I'm just trying to work out if I have some technical difficulties here. Right, so, um, what was I saying? So, moving from positions A to B on the, the map, you're going from uh, starting point to the Caverns of Mystery. You're going to Salt Marsh. You're going to wherever. There's likely to be something in the middle that you go to first to pick up supplies or like a township or villages, you'll cross those things. For the most part, DMs just want to go, it takes three days travel, blip, blip, done. And that's cool. But it's an opportunity for players and dungeon masters to really work out some more specifics about the game for themselves. For instance, uh, when the players move from, like, get out of their tavern and decide to head over to the to a set of caves where they've heard that there's some adventure that might take them through or may take them near a town and that town they may want to stop at because they want to hear rumors or whatever us resupply pick up some kit three days as a dm you can just go done the players probably like the idea of just going done let's get to the adventure but it's a good way for the dungeon master to just say, okay, what's the marching order? If you give me your marching order now, then this is what it's gonna be until we change, until an extra player or NPC, henchman, hireling, whatever. And then that way you're not asking that question when an event is about to happen. They just know, right, this is what we're doing. We've got this marching order in normal scenario, let's go, okay. And at night, you say, oh, what's your routine for packing up and getting camped together? This all lends itself to making it easier for you to plan down the line. If you want an, an encounter, you're not asking suspicious questions at the right time, uh, which is going to alert everybody. The other part of downtime and that's just the travel downtime between three spots and there's not a lot to be done I and mean, you've got the uh, magic users and clerics that need to have time to sleep and rest and recover in the morning for those hours in the morning what's what are the fighters doing are they practicing find out are they working in tactics together so that the thief can use the shorter stabbier weapons making holes block patterns they just need to be able to, the players don't need to come up with tactics or strategies, but what they do need to be able to say is, when the, for an hour every day, we're working together to learn how to fight and how each other fights. And that makes more sense when they're in a 10 by corridor and you've got three players that want to stand side by side and take on something. They need to be coordinated and, and that's how they get coordinated. <clears throat> if they don't ask, if they don't mention it, if you don't sort of give them that opportunity, then it never happens. You can, uh, oh, haven't we been adventuring enough together to, to know how it all works? It doesn't work that way. 
you, you've got to practice. You've got to really play with each other, like play, sword play. We saw it with um, in Lord of the Rings with Boromir and the, the Hobbits. They were learning how to sword play. And that's good, and that's the way it should be. Uh, you want your players to say, All right, okay, if every one hour every morning, this is what's going to happen. So during those three days, it's not just an uneventful three days. They've still got other things going on. And you may even ask, well, do you guys want to ask talk, talk about any topic with each other? Is there anything you'd like to share with each other? Because in a campaign setting, it's likely that one player may have some information about something that the others don't, and backgrounds come into play, and it's a lot more involved at that. One shots and tournaments, not so much, but you know, that's still you want want them to interact with each other as characters. Role playing doesn't require you to be uh, doing funny voices and, and putting on accents, but it's what would my character do? Now, let's talk about another element of downtime, and that's when you've got someone who's leveled up. We're looking at you, thief. The, when you level up and then say, okay, it's two weeks training or a week training. What happens to the rest of the party during that time? Do we just blip it? No, we shouldn't. If the thief is leveling up and training, then that's a great opportunity for the magic user to become part of the magic user's sorcerer's guild, magic user's guild, wizard's guild, trading group, whatever. Go and study at the library, go and pick out a a uh, higher learning education facility, university schooling, whatever, to work. So fighters becoming part of the militia, a, a casual bouncer at a bar or whatever, you know, that, that's a great opportunity for those sorts of things to happen and that don't impact on the game but provide enough background fluff and also provides the DM with some fodder for down the line. When you get multiple characters training, or uh, depending on how you do the training, obviously you might say, okay, you've got two or three weeks and someone's, you could have three characters out of six where that are out training, what are the other three doing? And that's more important. Magic users at a certain level will be writing scrolls, that making spells. They will be wanting to make potions at a certain level. And so on. So once they get to a certain point, they will want to do things. Clerics, same deal. Clerics may want to uh, create more miracles, spells, you know, and so on. So that's what you want to work on. And so give them the opportunity, give them the ability to think about that. Is there anything you want to do in the next three weeks? Yes, no, pick up supplies, and so on. So downtime can be used very creatively so that the players work together it can be used as a way of expanding uh, the character personalities some down the line gaming opportunities so the fighter becomes a bouncer for a, a night totally uneventful completely nothing to the side however during that night he may have upset someone kicked out a couple of people now they don't like them or they think yeah man we want to hire you to look after our party, like our room, function hall. And it leads to other adventures down the line and down the way and so on. And they're just fun. There's nothing more exciting than when all of a sudden the party who are saving the world just suddenly have to veer off so that they can look after this young noble's 21st. <laughs> That's it. And it's just funny. You gotta have some fun. And uh, like I said, it's a great way to explore some characters and so on. So downtime occurs between travel spots as well as when you've got that period of, of leveling up. And depending on how the leveling up is done, obviously DMs have to have that worked out. That's on my list of things that the DM needs to work out, how to level up. Once you've worked that out, let everybody know. And then when the first time someone has to do it, usually it's a couple of people. And then there's you say, oh, well, what's everyone else doing? 
and then you can start working on things like that. So anyway, so that's an important part of the adventure structure that a dungeon master really needs to to think about and encourage the players to work on as well. I mean, it's about encouraging them because I think that sometimes <clears throat> they get caught up on what is role playing and what we can do and can't do. Or it's not written here that we can do this. First edition AD and D is very much a game of rulings by the dungeon master and can a player do this like for instance they might say can i so well what's your background and can i make this spell can i do something like the players shouldn't be thinking about what they can't do more as exploring what's in their character arc some characters come from backgrounds that provide lots of different um, opportunities so if they might be a, a nobility or a, a higher function like a, a higher class um, character they will have reading and writing most likely reading and writing they will have um, perhaps painting they may even have a musical instrument to a very minor level because everyone should know how to play a musical instrument at a certain level and so on so that's you know the, the, depending on what the, the rules of society are if you look at say like a regency England you had poetry uh, music art all being explored and at varying levels but everyone just did it even though they knew that they were bad but it was something that they did. And that's what players need to sort of work out as well. So when it gets to doing something, can I ride a horse? Can you? You were born in the city, raised in the city, you were only been in a city. You're a country, you uh, worked on a farm, you um, a nobility or a lesser nobility and you were working in um, stables and lived around horses all your life. You'll have degrees of what players can and can't do with their horses and it's experience it's in in the pure form of ADND with the lack of non-weapon proficiencies and skills it comes down to the experience of that character so the character say I'm going to practice my horsemanship when the magic user and the cleric are praying every morning for an hour I'm going to go and ride my horse and learn how to do some horsemanship ride around they do that then you know as a dm what they're up to so then when it comes to horse comp like mounted combat how proficient are they at controlling their horse so anyway so that that's the sort of thing and you have to decide what they're good at can they swim can they swim so if they're by a stream they decide yep we're going to learn how to swim I'm going to learn a language. Learning a language, same deal. You need downtime to learn a language. There's no rules except for saying that it takes about six months. So you just say, I'm going to learn a language. You need someone to teach you that language. And that's where you might hire a scribe or you might hire an NPC to accompany you and teach you a language. Or you might have um, a player that's going to teach you one of their exotic languages and so on. Or you might live, might be working in an area where everyone speaks a form of red dragon or draconic, that sort of thing. So you, that's all downtime required and players need to be exploring that. All right, so from there we'll get on to our next topic and for that we need to set up a few things. So here we have our fifth level fighter. And over here, we have a number of brigands, zero levels, led by a first level. What we're gonna talk about today is the special rule that fighters have, which is level number of attacks per round. And we'll just sort of go through what that means and doesn't mean in terms of how it works, how it's put together. So initially, 
we have our zero levels that are all here. I'm trying to keep as many of these in as possible. Then we have our fifth level. When faced against one hit dice monsters or more, then it's just the standard attack routines and the standard routines. So with that, we're looking at um, being one attack. At fifth level, it's one attack. The good thing from being a fighter is that when you've got multiple nothing level characters, you can cut through swathes of enemies however you want. And that's good and just. Once you get to a certain high level, you don't want to have to deal with a lot of these. The damage done is usually enough to almost one hit one of these guys in the first place. So what can you do and how does it work? And at what point does it kick in? Well, as uh, it sort of suggests, the, hang on, sorry, I'm just trying to, hopefully this is getting through. The green dice, the green die will be the initiative for the enemy, and the blue being the fighter. So, first thing we need to do is we'll do everything else that's in initiative order. So let's assume first part of the scenario, something more like this, when we've got some degree of movement required, first level. Zero levels, fifth level. Trying to get this centered a little bit. There we go. See? That's what you pay for, people. High quality product. Alright, so the, this was the zeros and bad guys. This is our hero. So rolling on initiative. Our player goes first. <clears throat> so when the player goes first, we're close enough to be able to engage with combat. Now the rule being that the fighter has a level number of attacks per round when facing against an opponent. There's no opponent right now. They have to move to actually be with the opponent. So once we're here, we then roll our attack like normal. Or the fighter could have moved here and then have two opponents. But that's where we're at at the moment. We're able to do two opponents. And during the normal initiative round, still only gets the one attack. Being fifth level, rolls, an 18, hits, does copious amounts of damage, kills one. Everyone else now gets to move and do their thing. They have their attacks. Now post initiative, because the fighter's fifth level, gets two attacks at the end of after everything else. And surrounded by the four, the first attack hits we're assuming one hit, one kill. And second one, missed. Now we're on to the next round of initiative. So with the next round of initiative, we roll it up. And this time, they win. I'm keeping this guy out for the moment because I'm just dealing with this. Now, because we've got three guys in here, and technically they won, but because this is a fifth level fighter, the fifth level fighter gets five attacks in the round. One attack in the normal routine during the initiative, initiative phase, but then it alternates at the end of the round, beginning, end, beginning. So pre-initiative, this fighter gets two attacks, which Assuming that, that hits, and 
that might be, that's an eight, so touch and go, could be anything. We're assuming you missed this instance. And they respond with their attacks. Then it's the initiative turn, which is another hit. And then this fighter gets two more post initiative, which deals with them. So the fighter has dispatched everybody, which is good. That's what we kind of want out of our big bad fighters. They want to be tough. But they can't act other than a, than a combat action. They can't attack, do anything other than attack, pre-initiative. So the pre-initiative round, they can't just say, ah, oh, I charge. Because charge is a movement action. And charge is one action that's your attack for that round as, as a movement. So charging is different to the normal attacks. If originally they had one and they all moved in to engage, during their turn, the fighter still wouldn't have got the pre-initiative attacks because there's no one within range. Because the, the way that it works with the, you get your initiative attacks, so the attacks during the proper initiative round in the initiative order, and then you've got your out of initiative attacks which happen pre-initiative and post-initiative. Just like when you have two weapon wield, you gain an extra attack at the end of the round, after everybody else. And if you have an extra attack for whatever reason, you go to three attacks, then you get one at the beginning, pre-initiative, as long as it's all the conditions are met, the initiative round, then one at the end. At fourth level, you get two at the end. They go in initiative order at the back and at the front. So if you've got an instance where this fighter here this fighter here both have two weapons that they're wielding and fighting with so they both get two attacks it's all going to be led by initiative who goes first who, who has the first opportunity who has the second opportunity is all going to be based on the initiative role because they have the same number of attacks if um, this one was a higher level and had two attack routines during the initiative round and a dual wield, so it gets the extra attack. Then it gets two attacks during the initiative round and one attack at the end, because dual wielding only adds one extra attack. Sometimes it's worthwhile just because it's an extra dice to roll. Um, so monks having two hand axes, two daggers, thieves going the dagger and the short sword, the fighters, if they're not employing a shield, having an extra weapon to go the magic users, two daggers, illusionists especially, two daggers, that's good, that sort of thing. So you can just sort of work out how you want to do it from there. That's dual weapon wield. So next bit. We have our forces laid out. The fighter comes in. The fighter wins initiative, comes in, does its one attack during the initiative round. The first level moves to engage. The fighter is now no longer <coughs> engaged with only zero levels. So loses the opportunities for the post initiative attack. Same deal if for whatever reason the round starts surrounded and the fighter gets two attacks pre-initiative then it's the turn of these guys gets the one attack in initiative round doesn't get any further because now you've got a first level this is where target allocation comes in because the Gygax method is that this is a swirling melee and the fighter can't say I attack this one person 
or this one person or this one person just attacks and then randomly you have to assign that. So in this instance, the fighter would say, right, I attack. And we've gone one, two, three, four, attacking that one. But the first level is still engaged, so no more further attacks. This is one of those areas you just need to be careful about as a DM, and you really want to make sure that you've got down pat because players will always like to say, I attacked the one I attacked before, or the one that's already been hit, I'm going to attack. <clears throat> now, when you've got a giant, easy. When you've got one that's a standout, so say an ogre that's in around a bunch of orcs, but apart from that, you've got a swarm of guys all around you. You're not picking and choosing who you're attacking. You're attacking where you've got an opportunity available. And that opportunity available may not be the one that you want. So those four, one, two, three, four. This one. And the same goes with the enemy. The enemy would love it if it was this guy, because now he can't get in there because of space required for weapons and whatever else. Has to make an end run. And that's a full movement to get through there. And can't attack, however, does stop this one from having post-initiative attacks. So this is one of those areas where it gets a little bit head messy. But the likelihood, I mean, I shouldn't say the likelihood. There was a great um, Black Adder episode where the king was covered in blood because he, with his paring knife, he fought an entire army. That's a 20th level fighter going for it. <laughs> you have yeah, two attacks in the middle and then you, as your, you've got your attacks. It's just a boom. You're just, you're just nuts. So the, the, the level of times per... Um, per round supersedes your normal attack routines. Um, so the fighter who's eighth level up against a bunch of men at arms has eight attacks that round with one in the initiative phase, the initiative portion, four post-initiative and three pre-initiative. You can't move or engage. You have to already be engaged. So if the, at the beginning of the next round, for whatever reason, let's assume they're all zero levels, they're all on, then the initiative's rolled, even if this one loses initiative, and he goes, right, ah, boom, one, two, they're all, you know, two guys go down. When you think about it thematically, the number of times when you've got like that swarm that hit the big fighter, and then the big fighter stands up and pushes it all away. That's what we're talking about. Sorry, just had to change locations. So now, um, hopefully I covered those two topics well, and if that's something that you'd like to see more of, please comment down below and let me know how everything's going. Uh, if you've got any other ideas and suggestions. I've got some thoughts that have been sent to me by some people, so we'll be exploring some other interesting in-game mechanics for uh, AD&D. Um, some of it will be how I deal with it and some of it will be more specifically on the rules and, and how the rules handle. So, all right. so I want to thank everybody. Subscribe, patron, all the usual bits and pieces. Keep playing, get out there. It's all about having fun, like-minded people just getting together, um, just throwing it out and, and having a good time playing a game uh, so other links will be down below so please have a look and then uh, see if there's anything there that captures your eye all right thank you very much catch you later